Good morning. Welcome to Mulberry Street United Methodist Church. We're so glad that you're worshiping with us this morning. Uh, we are a church on mission to share the heart of God from the heart of downtown Macon, and here's how you can be part of that mission. First, there is chili and apple pie on the premises. And I hope that whether you brought chili or apple pie or not, that you will join us for lunch immediately following this service over here in our fellowship hall. I'm looking forward to trying all the different chilies. I'm not a huge fan of apples, but I might try some pies too. Second, uh, Lent is coming up. Lent begins next Wednesday with Ash Wednesday. I hope that you'll take note of the common devotional as listed on the back of your bulletin and purchase a copy of that book. Let the church office know if you need help securing a copy. We'll begin reading that together on Ash Wednesday, so that's next Wednesday. Then you see some dates there to hold for special Lenten services, including our Ash Wednesday service, which will begin with a meal together, a simple meal in the fellowship hall at 530, and then we'll move into the sanctuary for our service 630 next Wednesday. Third, a brief update on Kids for Christ and Youth. There will be no Kids for Christ this evening, and the youth will meet from 4 to 6 instead of from 5 to 7. So parents, you should already know that, but in case you missed it, um, those are the announcements. No Kids for Christ tonight, and youth from 4 to 6 instead of 5 to 7. Finally, you may have seen and probably did see in the news this week the devastating earthquake in Turkey and Syria. As of this morning, the latest death toll was 28,000 people. It's a remarkably uh, tragic event that's occurred over there. We've included in the bulletin some ways you can give through UMCOR. UMCOR is the United Methodist Committee on Relief. One of the great things about UMCOR is of the money you give directly to them, something like 97% of it goes directly to aid relief. That's because in our apportionments, we pay their ad administrative costs. So the money you give to them goes directly to benefit those who were impacted. And I was looking this morning, UMCOR has already been giving grants and sending aid over to Turkey and Syria. So if you haven't given yet uh, to support those victims, there's detailed information here in the bulletin on how you can do that. You can also write a check, mark the memo line for UMCOR and put it in the offering plate later this morning and we'll make sure that gets to them. We have come to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So let us turn our hearts and our minds and our attention, all that we are and all that we have, to the worship of our Lord and Savior this morning. The Lord be with you. Happy are those whose way is blameless. Blessed are those who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are those who keep God's decrees. Blessed are those who seek God with their whole heart. God has commanded that his precepts be kept diligently. We pray that we may be faithful in keeping all his statutes. If we pay attention to all his commands, we will not be put to shame. As we learn God's righteous judgments, we will praise God with an upright heart. And let us do so now by standing to sing our opening hymn of praise, hymn number 400, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
As we remain standing, let's affirm our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed, saying together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. At this time, we'd like to invite our children forward for our children's moment with Miss Elisa. Good morning. Oh, hello. How are you? All right, let's try that again, but I did love that. Good morning. You know I've got to see those smiles, so turn around and let's look at Missy Lisa. There we go. That just warms my heart so much, and I have something very special in my pocket. I know. Hold on. Hold on. Patience. I have a valentine. Somebody gave me my first valentine. Valentine is coming up this week. Did y'all know that? Have you been to the stores to see all the balloons, all the flowers? All? So I'm on, yeah, you have. Okay, so I'm going to ask you about the word love. <gasps> love, what does love mean? Anybody know what love means? Tell me. Exactly. Somebody you love with everything that you have, a pet or a family member or something special to you, right? So how do you show love? How do you show love? Show me just... Oh, that was a wonderful thing. To be with them shows them love. How else can we show love? How else? Huh? Yes, if somebody gets married, you show love that way. But how do you show love? We're not getting married yet. Okay, we're going to hold off. Yeah, you got like. But I better be invited. Okay, just saying. Okay, how else? Dang, dang, listen. You could hug them. Give them a great big hug, right? So we can give our friends a hug. That is something easy. I see some, Thomas doing something very special right here. Look at Thomas. Do it again. You, oh, there. What's he doing? Do you see that beautiful smile? He's smiling. He's smiling. He's showing love to his friends without saying a word. You don't have to say a word. You don't have to say, I love you. Oh, thank you. I love you. And see, that is so sweet. So I got my valentine. But how does God show you he loves you? Does he tell you he loves you? He can't, right? But do you feel it? How do you feel love? Exactly. You pray. So God can show you his love because he's given you a wonderful family to be with. He's got great friends. 
and sisters and brothers that love each other so very much. <laughs> and I just think that is so amazing because I'm an only child, I didn't get one of them. So that is great. So God shows you love. So we can go and buy gifts for people to show them love, right guys? But we don't have to give them this expensive gift to show them how much we love them. Because you know what God did for us to show his love? He sent his son. I know, that's hilarious. He sent his son for us. And that was the ultimate love sacrifice, is to give him to us. I love you guys. So say it back to Missy Lisa. I love you guys. Oh, I thank you so much. That just warms my heart. I love you. 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 And they're going, what? No, you don't. You're not my mom, but I love you, Missy Lisa. All right, pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your son. We thank you for our friends and our family that love us so much. But God loves us more. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, walk, ladies and gentlemen. Our first lesson this morning comes from Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. Let us hear the word of the Lord together. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways and observing his commandments, decrees and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you can so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us now stand again and sing our next hymn, hymn 534, Be Still, My Soul.
That was the anthem that was sung on my first Sunday with you. And what a great eight months it has been to be with you. Let's pray together as we approach this preaching moment. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our thoughts and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for you. Unless you speak, nothing of significance will be spoken. Amen. Carter's favorite candy is a Kit Kat. It's important knowledge this morning because last Valentine's Day, his kindergarten teacher gave him a Reese's peanut butter cup. Carter despises peanut butter and doesn't like Reese's. And if you know Carter, he's not afraid to stand up for himself and let you know what he wants. So he came into my room that evening to let me know how proud he was of himself. When he got the Reese's and he saw classmates getting Kit Kats, he started to get angry. But then he said to himself, you get what you get and you don't pitch a fit, and decided he could be content with the Reese's. And surprise, as he ate it, he actually liked it, kinda. That's a kindergarten class at six years old, but I think we can all relate because we've all had times where we haven't gotten what we wanted. Perhaps we've even witnessed others getting what we wanted at the same time and then gotten angry or bitter or resentful. Think of a time when you got angry, when you didn't get what you wanted, or when things didn't turn out as planned, or when someone else got something you thought you deserved. We've all been there. And Jonah's there too. He's angry because he didn't get what he wanted, and he's not shy about letting God know about it. Let's hear that story from near the end of the book of Jonah, beginning with chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what they did, they being the people of Nineveh, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jonah is angry. He didn't get what he wanted. He wanted Nineveh destroyed. That was the whole point of God sending Jonah to Nineveh. You may recall that God had called Jonah to deliver such a message, and rather than deliver the message, Jonah fled by ship away from God. A storm comes and the sailors decide to throw Jonah overboard, thinking that Jonah is the reason for the storm, that God is angry and the storm will abate if they throw him overboard. When they do, a whale comes and swallows Jonah, causing Jonah to repent and agree to deliver the message. In retellings of this story, especially in children's tales, that's where the story ends. Jonah agrees to do what God wants, with the message being that we are to obey God. Except in the book of Jonah, that's the middle. As the story moves on from that middle section, Jonah does go to Nineveh and delivers the message. A message that boils down to this. You're all going to die because you're a very bad people. In fact, it's a message that Jonah decides he's kind of excited to deliver because Nineveh is the capital city of the hated Assyrians, the people who had destroyed the northern kingdom. They're the bullies on the block. So it's maybe not so bad after all to have to go tell your arch nemesis they're all going to die. Jonah delivers the message, but surprise, God doesn't destroy the city. They repent, they apologize, they worship God, and God relents. God decides to save the people from the destruction that he had planned to bring upon them. So put yourself in Jonah's shoes. He tried to run away from God, not wanting to deliver this message. God terrifies him with a storm, swallows him up, 
in a whale, which then spits him out on dry ground. And imagine with me for a moment being covered in whatever goo exists on the inside of a whale. And so he relents. He goes to deliver this message, one he actually decides he's excited about. And after all that, God decides not to do what he told Jonah to tell the people he was going to do. After all that Jonah went through, after all that Jonah did to deliver God's message of death and destruction, it turns out it was all for naught. Not only that, but Jonah looks like a false prophet. His reputation is maligned. According to Deuteronomy 18, the way you know a false prophet of God is whether or not what the prophet says comes true. So Jonah looks like a false prophet. Here we have Jonah, unbathed since being covered in whale goo, tired from traveling, looking like a false prophet. His enemies are not destroyed, but instead they're saved. It's easy to imagine Jonah is not happy about this. In fact, the English translation of verse 1 of chapter 4 is far kinder than the Hebrew. In Hebrew, it says that Jonah thinks what God did was evil to Jonah, a great evil, and it burned him. And so he says to God, you wasted my time, you wasted my efforts. I didn't want to go here in the first place. And I knew, I just knew that you would do something like this because you're gracious and loving and merciful and all that. Because Jonah knew from the very beginning that God is compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. From Jonah's perspective, he's wondering why he had to go through the storm, the whale get covered in goo, why he had to go through all of that if in the end it didn't matter. Jonah didn't get what he wanted, and he's angry about it, so angry that he thinks God has done him a great evil, and it burn, <clears throat> burns him. As we saw with Carter and his candy, and to a much greater extent in Jonah's reaction to God, it's natural to get angry when we don't get what we want. And beyond material things, there are times in life where we don't get what we wanted, what we thought we even perhaps deserved, just like we see with Jonah. There's the job promotion that went to someone else or the raise we got passed over for. There's the financial opportunity that didn't pan out or maybe even cost us. There are relationships that didn't turn out well or are even broken now where once they were close. There are family relationships that are that way too, but those always seem to hurt a bit more. There's a depression that settles in life sometimes when life doesn't turn out the way we hoped. Dreams are lost or just the general malaise of finding ourselves bored by our current life and yet stuck where we are. There's all sorts of ways in this life that we find that we don't get what we wanted. And it's not about the material things that are here today and gone tomorrow. It's about the deeper things of life. Not getting affirmed by things at work. Not getting the family and friends we desire. Not getting the life we imagined. Consider that Henry David Thoreau quote. Actually, Thoreau never said it, but it gets attributed to him anyway. The quote says, go boldly in the direction of your dreams. Live the life you have imagined. Many of us have lived long enough to know you can go boldly in the direction of your dreams only to find yourself majorly disappointed. We can imagine a particular life for ourselves, but it's rare it actually happens the way that we dreamt. Life has too many twists and turns, too many things that are beyond our control. And so it's easy to find ourselves, like Jonah, angry at the way things have turned out. Angry that we didn't get what we wanted. What are we to do in those moments? One of the great disappointments in my life was not passing my ordination interviews the first time. I sailed through the theology and doctrine interview. I sailed through called and disciplined life where they check your self-awareness and your health. In fact, I passed 
those components of the interview. But I failed preaching. They tore apart my sermon. When the news was delivered to me, it didn't make any sense to me at all. I argued with the two clergy who came to deliver the news and thought I was winning the argument, but it came to no avail. The decision was made, and I would have to wait a year and come back the next year and try again. I was mad. It's hard to recall a time I was more angry than I was that day and for many days afterward. I didn't get what I wanted, what I thought I deserved, which was to be passed so that I could be ordained at that annual conference. I thought their feedback was wrong and badly stated. I could not make sense of why they had failed me. I kept hearing from colleagues it would make sense when I got the written feedback in the mail. The feedback came and it was scant, hastily written, sorely lacking in depth and only made me angrier. I stayed hot, so this is in March, beginning of March. I stayed hot through annual conference in June of that year. I skipped the ordination service where a dear friend of mine got ordained, which is still something I regret. I was just too angry to go. I was like Jonah, mad at how things had turned out, angry about how I'd been treated, throwing myself a pity party and inviting anyone who wanted to come and join me. Until one day, Someone, and I still can't remember who, asked me to wonder to myself what God was doing. Maybe it was not God's will that I got deferred, which is our nice way of saying fail the ordination interview, or maybe it was. Either way, there'd be redemption if I would allow it to happen if I would choose to leave my anger behind and look for what God was doing in the midst of my life. That turned out to be sage advice. Upon leaving my anger behind and looking around me, I discovered God was doing two things. First, this should be probably no surprise, I'm a classic overachiever who passes everything the first time and gets great grades all the time. I've never made a C in my life. The last time I got a B was 2005 as an undergraduate, and that was four degrees ago. I worked hard in seminary and graduate school and always came out with an A minus. That's what I do. I'm that kind of student. So failing anything was not in my experience, but failing was a great dose of humility. I needed a dose of humility, especially about my overachieving top-notch student ways. It was helpful to fail, for I discovered not only humility, but that I had too much of my identity and self-worth wrapped up in how much I could achieve. That has proven especially helpful ever since, something I haven't forgotten, but applied to other areas of my life as well. I also learned through failure that I am capable of rising to the challenge posed by the failure itself. That was the second lesson and more powerful. I found a reservoir of internal strength and character I didn't know I had. Once I had taken that person's advice to see what God might do through my failure, I applied myself wholeheartedly to the task of improving my preaching. I read books. I went to a conference on preaching. I had many people review my sermons and give me feedback. I got great feedback. I'm a better preacher as a result. The point being, God was doing something through my life circumstances, through circumstances I didn't want, I didn't ask for, and failure I thought was undeserved. To move forward with my life, all I needed to do was look around me and see what God was doing. When you fail an ordination interview in our annual conference, you have to wait a whole year to try again. At first, that seemed unbearable. But as I moved past my anger and took a look at what God was doing, I found patience in the waiting. I saw opportunity to improve and rested in how God was shaping me through that experience. In short, when I saw what God was doing, I found patience in the waiting. And that's just the point we've been talking about this whole sermon series on patience. 
looking to see what God is doing around us in the waiting. Whether we're waiting for some day to arrive and we expect something great will happen, whether we're waiting for God to act in an area of our lives, whether we're enduring hardship or suffering of some kind, whether we're waiting to hear from God or angry when we don't get what we want, we are called to look and see what God is doing now in our midst. Patience is called for when we don't get what we want. The patience of waiting to see what God is doing. Because when things don't turn out as expected, God is doing something else, something surprising, something most definitely amazing in our midst. In Nineveh, God was turning an entire foreign people toward him, showing how his concern and mercy spread to all of creation. That was a powerful word for Jonah, who thought that only people like him, the people of God, the Israelites, were blessed in that way. In my ordination, God was uncoupling my identity from achievement and making me a more effective preacher. I just needed patience to step back and see what God was doing, patiently waiting for the next opportunity to interview for ordination. Patience is called for when we don't get what we want. The patience of waiting to see what God is doing. So, when there's a job promotion that went to someone else or the raise that we got passed over for, when there's the financial opportunity that didn't pan out and maybe even cost us, when there are relationships that didn't turn out well or, or are even broken where now they were once they were close, when there are family relationships that are that way too and those always seem to hurt more, when there's depression, when life in general doesn't turn out as we'd hoped, when dreams are lost, when that general malaise of finding ourselves bored with our current life and yet stuck in that life, in other words, when we don't get what we want out of life, the task is patience. The patience to take a step back from our disappointment, from our anger, to look and see where God is moving, what God is doing in our midst. There's something there. God is always moving and active. The question is whether or not we have eyes to see it. So here at the end of this patient sermon series, the question before us remains and will remain after we've left this behind is to, the question is whether or not we have eyes to see how God is moving and active around us, allowing what we see to inspire patience. That's where we find hope in the waiting. It's hard to find hope when we're feeling impatient, wanting things to change, wanting things to be as we had expected them, wanting hardship to end, wanting to get what we wanted in the first place. It's hard to wait. But we find hope in the waiting when we look and see where God is active and moving in our lives. And so as we've said in the last several sermons and again today, one of the best ways to discover that is that practice of examine that we've been talking about. Asking yourself on a daily basis, what am I most grateful for today and what am I least grateful for today? The trick with this practice, like many spiritual disciplines, is to practice it regularly. If practicing by yourself, write it down so you can go back and see over time what God is doing. If you're practicing with a loved one or two or with your nuclear family, remind each other where you have seen God moving and working as you share those answers around the dinner table or at the end of the day. Or maybe you're running around town shepherding children and youth to games and other extracurriculars, or maybe you're commuting yourself to different meetings that you have or just commuting to your job or commuting to your next obligation. Even in those moments, we can turn off the radio, have the children put the devices down, and have a moment to reflect together, asking each other those questions. What am I most grateful for today? And what am I least grateful for today? Every moment of routine is a moment for reflection. Asking ourselves those questions will call our attention to where God is moving in our lives. So pray that form of examine daily and become a patient disciple of Christ, one whose life is marked by peace. 
then we will be able to wait, endure, listen, be patient in everything. When we don't get what we want, we can see the amazing and surprising things God is doing in our lives if we have eyes to see because God is always active and moving in our lives in the good and the bad. Practicing patience, in fact, means actively looking to see what God is doing in the waiting. So pray, examine daily and gain eyes to see what God is doing. Patience is hard, but patience will transform how we see our lives. What is God doing right now in your life? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, we admit before you that your church is often full of discord, argument, and hurt. We too often forget that you have bound us together as one people, as one family. Guide us as we live out your law of love and strengthen us as we support one another on our journeys of faith. Loving God, help us to turn our hearts towards you. We pray for the world that you would draw all people to yourself, to your love that is available to all. Empower our work here in our community as we seek out the common good with our neighbors and work to extend the love of Christ to others. Loving God, help us to turn our hearts toward you. We pray for creation. We acknowledge that our actions can have disastrous consequences for the community of this earth. Give us wisdom as we consider how our habits and our consumptions might lead to flourishing instead of destruction. Loving God, help us to turn our hearts toward you. God of comfort, be near to those who suffer or are in need. Bring healing and relief in places of disaster and equip us to be bearers of your compassion to those who need hope and healing. Loving God, help us to turn our hearts toward you. Loving Father, we know that you hear our prayers, and we know that though we may not always see the answers that we want to see, that you always act in the fullness of your timing, that you turn our pain, our needs, our wants into something good, into something beautiful. And because of this, we do not pray with timidity, but boldly as your children. And thus today we are bold to pray that prayer that your son Jesus taught us to pray, saying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
standing, let us join together in our final hymn as printed in your bulletin. And let us, with the Spirit's daring, step from our past and leave behind our disappointment, guilt, and grieving, seeking new paths and sure to find. Christ is alive and goes before us to show and share what love can do. This is a day of new beginnings. Our God makes all things new.
Go in peace. Thank you.